Hello and welcome, I'm Tafara Gadamu. My guest today, Dr. Gabisa Jeta, a distinguished professor at Purdue University in the United States, is also a World Food Prize laureate for his groundbreaking work on sorghum. He's also very keen on education. Professor Gabisa Jeta, welcome to the program. Thank you very much and thanks for having me here. I'd like to start, you know, this is very unusual, but I have um, to, to start from point A. You growing up as a kid way back in the 60s in Ethiopia, um, you never wanted to be um, uh, involved in what you're doing today. You never trained to be involved in agriculture or related issues. You wanted to be an engineer. Well, true, but even that is further ahead, uh, moving forward. But growing up as a young kid in West Central Ethiopia, uh, even thinking about school wasn't within our reach. And uh, You had to walk four hours to get to school, the nearest school, right? Uh, yes, and initially the only ch schools available to us were church schools, just to count the alphabets and uh, learn how to read and write. And, and then uh, uh, more and more of us were interested in getting m modern education, and in my case, um, as I've told over and over again, it was my poor mother who decided that uh, if I received modern education, life would be better for me and for her in the long run, and that's what started it. And as you said, the first school that I attended was about 20 kilometers from home because there wasn't any school around where we lived. It's very interesting for mothers to be of that influence to their kids. It's, that's very unusual, isn't it? Because well, the position they have. Uh, certainly not really, because mothers are always very influential, and mothers uh, are, are very powerful in, in raising children, uh, the, the contributions they make. But what is unusual, as you say, is uh, an illiterate woman. Um, and that would have uh, the conviction that she would sacrifice to make sure that her only son would get an education because if he did, life would be better for her son and, and perhaps for herself as well. That indeed is very unusual to me and I, I'm sure, you know, uh, I, I say very often looking back with all that had happened in my life and I don't think she ever dreamed and that uh, things would turn out the way they did, um, even if she didn't. And to have had that kind of perspective, uh, it's just very difficult to imagine. And so I kind of say maybe somewhat providential that she, she thought so. But it, it is unusual. I mean, she, she not only set the course for you, but what's more even unusual is the fact that she told you to study agriculture. Why? What, what was... She, she never had any information, I'm assuming, because except for the fact that she was living uh, in one of the rural villages. Oh, I'm glad you asked that question because actually she did not. I think that story had been told and captured, but uh, uh, she did not. And, and I think... Uh, Where did it come from then? Oh, it, it, it later on. I think this is uh, actually... I had already been admitted to a boarding school, uh, to a high school in Jimma, and studied agriculture. And, uh, and then I had, and I had to go on to college, and uh, the college that was available to us uh, for admission was Alama College of Agriculture. And that was the only, probably the only university that we had then. The only the college of agriculture that we had at the time, and that was, in, in my case, both the high school that I went to and the college that I went to was established by Oklahoma State University, uh, sponsored by the Point Four program, which was really the predecessor of the USAID. And so it was kind of automatic if you passed the exam we didn't have to take the ESLC exams to go to college in our time. We just needed to take a test from Alamaya to qualify. And then that was straight. And then we go straight to Alamaya. And then it was Alamaya. This story of studying agriculture uh, came about. And, and that is that uh, I wanted to study engineering and because I liked math and, and I thought I would be good at studying that. And I spent uh, a couple of weeks and the courses that were being presented, uh, I was beginning to believe that you know, I wasn't sure how they would relate it, be related to problem solving. 
And so I went seeking counsel by a department head in the plant sciences department, and uh, he was the person who actually switched gears for me and said, if you would study plant sciences, you have a greater likelihood of um, livelihood change for the poor through what you did. And the way he was getting that from was he had just returned from the United States having pursued a, a doctoral program at University of Minnesota, which was the university where Norm Borlaug had gone to. And so Norm Borlaug had just received his Nobel Prize for his contribution in agriculture, and he used that as an example to encourage me to study um, plant sciences uh, to work on improvement of crops for the poor. Very interesting. Let's let's make a very straight jump, you know, to once you graduated from what is it, Purdue University then? That's when you went to college and did your PhD, right? My undergraduate college, as, you, as I said, was Alamai, and then I went to graduate program Purdue University, yes. Exactly. That's when you got start, you, you, you picked up the interest in sorghum, right? Uh, actually, I started working on sorghum even before I went to America. Um, I had just finished college, and uh, and because um, um, uh, very often in our time, the students that scored relatively better than others would be uh, approached about being retained in the same college where you've been to as junior faculty member with the idea that they would be sent overseas to conduct um, graduate school and graduate studies and come back and teach. And uh, the resource that made that possible for me was a grant from IDRC of Canada given to one of the professors on campus to work on sorghum improvement. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, he now lives in, uh, in, in Addis Ababa, Dr. Brani. And so he recruited about four of us, four young men uh, from the same class, and uh, uh, he recruited us to work on sorghum. And you persevered, right? I persevered, yes. I persevered. Uh, um, I like the crop and the importance of the crop for the poor, and uh, all four were given the opportunity to study in Canada, and I kind of changed my mind and ended up going to the United States to work with the, the mentor that I worked for, and, uh, and that has changed my life as a result of going to Purdue. It's interesting because the turning point is in, uh, culminated uh, as a result of your work in the Sudan, right? Working on sorghum and coming up with what you did. Yes. Um, I think uh, I had just finished my PhD in 1978, and uh, those were kind of rough times in Ethiopia. And so I decided not to return, but yet I had the desire to come and work in developing countries. And so I wrote... Uh, an international agency that had programs all over Africa. And I asked if I could be given an opportunity to work in the region where Ethiopia is located. But uh, my intentions were to end up to Kenya, Uganda, or Tanzania. I didn't have any expectations Sudan would come in the picture. But uh, uh, they had a spot in Sudan, and they asked me if I would take it. And uh, I did. And it turned out to be a marvelous assignment for me um, because Sudanese uh, are wonderful people. Um, I enjoyed living and working there, and they accepted me as one of theirs. And sorghum was a very important crop, uh, perhaps even more important than it is in Ethiopia. And so if you are a, a sorghum scientist, uh, you are just a king in, in Sudan. And uh, as it turned out, I was successful in... Yeah that breakthrough, right? I had a, I had a significant breakthrough, uh, really a breakthrough that truly has changed the path of my professional life. Uh, uh, I was young, coming out of uh, graduate school, lots of energy and desire to make a difference, and I was given this huge opportunity to work in improving a crop that is of significant importance to the largest sorghum producer in the region. And uh, fortunately, I lucked out. And make, yeah, to make it more productive, right? To, to, I developed and sorghum. Drought resistant and, and, and also yeah. that weed. 
Abs uh, absolutely. Uh, sorghum is a very drought tolerant crop to start with. And, uh, and so my challenge was how can I uh, develop the crop that is even more drought tolerant than it is and make it more productive um, and, and deliver it to farm communities. And so I developed a new technology, new research methods on how to conduct f for drought tolerance. Um, and, and that approach succeeded and then I packaged it on putting together a hybrid crop um, that is more productive than ever done before and it was really the first uh, time where uh, a sorghum hybrid uh, was discovered and developed and commercially made available. And then uh, the most significant part of it is putting together uh, a mechanism for the production, uh, distribution, and marketing of seed. And, and you have to put it to test, right? Uh, the, the farmers have to accept it, and you had to travel to several African countries to prove that, right? Uh, was yes. it easy in coming? Uh, no, no. Um, the, the science was um, uh, easier than than putting together the delivery mechanism, uh, even though the science... You mean from the receiving aid from the farmers, or...? Um, this is what I'm trying to point out. I mean, you know, you have new products. Yes. And our farmers uh, tend to be more conservative yes. because we've lived, you know, with a certain crop forever. You don't yes. want to see any change yes. coming to that. Absolutely. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. No, it's, uh, you're absolutely right. and. Uh, Particularly when the farm communities that you're dealing with uh, have not been exposed to new technology. Um, uh, that first um, deployment process is very often very hard. And also when the technology is a technology that they had never been exposed to before, um, it makes it doubly difficult. And so here we have sorghum, a drought tolerant crop, all by, the, by itself is not new to them. But we put it in a, in a technology that I call hybrid sorghum to you. But it requires uh, developing two sets of parents um, and these parents are selected for drought tolerance, but then you're not making the parents available to the farmer. You make a cross, and that immediate seed you get from the cross is what you give to the farmer. But you do it in such a way that that hybrid is reprodu reproducible every year, and the same performance parameter is made available to the farmer every year. And so the way we do that and part of the problem that we ran into was we develop one of the parent is genetically male sterile so it doesn't produce the anthers that produce this, the pollen and so that way without doing anything at all we just plant them side by side the wind will blow the pollen from one parent and this doesn't have any pollen anyway and so the seed would be setting here so we won't harvest any seed from this one we will only harvest the seed only from the male sterile parent Okay, that way the seed that is produced is exactly of the same genetic makeup every year. Um, but we, in, in promoting this technology, we started telling the farmers so they would believe us this is hybrid vigor. And to get it a hybrid vigor, we produced it on this genetically male sterile. What was the result like? The result was superior, but the psychological, the culture issue is what came about and, um, and really uh, gave us some problem. In, um, in a more paternalistic society, uh, that idea of a male sterile issue <laughs> became became a problem, and so the farmers thought they would be sterile if they ate our salt. Fast forward, 09, you won the World Food Prize. I did. E you ever expected that you were going to win that? No, I did not. No, I did not. It, it came as a surprise. It was a total surprise. One of the few prestigious prizes that I've ever heard of. Uh, no, it's, it's the highest honor anyone working in agriculture would get. It's a Nobel Prize for Agriculture. And so I did that work in Sudan, um, but the World Food Prize recognized two pieces of work that I had done. One was the drought tolerant work in Sudan, and then when I went back to the United States, I embarked on a new line of research, and the parasitic weed, Striga, is a major problem in Africa. And so... It has always been. Yeah, it has always been. And so I picked that up and developed a new 
uh, novel approach to addressing the problem and fortunately succeeded in understanding the genetics and the biology. We put together a process that involved chemistry, molecular biology, genetics and plant breeding to address some of this problem. It was multidisciplinary. It was, it was a multidisciplinary approach to, to develop the, the eventual product and uh, and then again just like in Sudan we also thought about the delivery mechanisms how to make sure that the farmers got the product and whether or not the product made a difference and all of that work in the United States was done in the lab not in the field and then uh, the, the confidence and the gumption that we had that eventually would translate into as good productivity when it was brought into Africa it was a huge leap of faith but it worked for us. But still we keep on suffering from hunger, malnutrition, and so on and so forth. I mean, what you set out to address when you, was, when you were a young kid at Alamaya University is not yet addressed. Does that make you a little bit you know, uncomfortable with what you do? Because this is, like, people like you, one of the few great scientists in the, in the field. I mean, you cannot solve this problem. I mean at least not in your lifetime, in our lifetime. Does well, that make you a little bit... Uh, absolutely not. I think uh, it may be a case of is the glass half full or half empty? I like to think it is half full. We've come a long way and science has contributed significantly to the lives of the poor in developing countries. And even if you take the situation in this country, we have, we have had you know, dramatic gains in new technologies that have come out and beginning to make contribution to the lives of the poor. In the 90s, uh, significant gains were made in exposing our farm communities to the use of improved seeds and fertilizers. Uh, significant yield results are being uh, obtained and reported by farmers that have adopted. But when you have 80 million people even though you're making significant contribution, it doesn't show uh, on aggregate statistics because we got a lot of people that we need to reach. And, but to really label all of that have, as having succeeded is, is, is truly not right. But we've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go because we've got hundreds and millions of people that, that we need to reach with science and technology and innovation. And so and the emphasis then is how can we accelerate this and how can we learn the experiences of others to make sure that science does uh, change livelihood of the poor in Africa as it has in other places. But that would take us in a totally different direction and that is to really begin to think about what the bottlenecks are. And in my way of thinking as I go around and speaking, what I say is that to really begin to have impact generated, having attraction on the ground and uh, using to bring about science-based development, what you need are, one, you need to have some way of generating the science and technology and innovation. The way to do that is to build your human capacity and strengthen the institutions in the country. Because you can rely on foreign assistance in all kinds of things, but really the best way you can build your nation is by engaging your nationals and, and having that nation building come organically from within. And so you need science, technology and innovation and institutions that would allow you to generate the science and the technology, but also in institutions that would support all of the institutional infrastructure structure for, for the educational programs, for the research program, for the, uh, the delivery, for the seed production, for the financing, the credit and the market, all of those institutions need to be developed. That even make, makes the, your, your ideas a little bit more complex it because is. you are you are talking about a multi-headed uh, you know, ghost. Absolutely. And that's why I say development is not something that would take place overnight. It's a generational experiential process that would move from one generation to the next. But you uh, cannot start on all tracks. You cannot run you on all tracks. Of course you can. Of course you can. Because and that's exactly what's happening around us. Um, but but some of these tracks are fa you know, further ahead than others. And so if I may finish my thought that 
The science and technology is important, the institutional building, the human capacity is important, but to be able to do this as effectively as you want to, you need to have the right sets of governance and policy and the leadership in the country that truly would believe in bringing about that kind of dramatic change in a nation. And so policy is important, governance is important, so that you need leaders that have a that kind of perspective that you need all of this to be put together as effectively as possible to move us forward. But as you said, it makes it an even more challenging process. And so what I'm saying is it needs to be done from one generation to another. What it means is it's not only enough to train the best talent possible, but it's equally important even more to retain that talent from within so that you're producing a system where one generation is learning from the generation before so that you've got some traction on the ground on all of those experiences gained. Not in many African countries today what happens is you have an activity in the various sectors I described for a few years and then people leave and you kind of start all over again and that is not a way to develop a nation in any way. How do you mean that. That I, I think that's the kind of that's why I'm putting a lot of the responsibility on on governance and policy. And I think you need to to have the leadership determine uh, the best way to move forward and make sure that there are things put in place uh, to make sure that that would happen for for a country. Do you um, see hope along that line? Uh, I I think again uh, again a case of uh, glass being half full, and that. You know, I, I, talk, I, I tell people that in my own lifetime, in the last 40 years of my adulthood, and other than the first generation of African leaders that had come forward, that, ha that were truly dynamic, uh, brought about independence to the nation, were really driven to bring about change in the continent. After that, after the first generation of those leaders, we really went down the drain with all the revolutions that have gone on, the conflict in, 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 in across the continent. But I am beginning to feel that there are a number of leaders today that are really committed to bring about science-based development to Africa. Yes, again, I'm, I'm very hopeful and very positive about what I'm seeing. You've been appointed by President Obama as the science envoy for his government, right? Yes. And also you are advisor to USAID. And you've, you, you traveled to Ethiopia, not only to Ethiopia, to, to many African countries. Uh, probably next week you will be on your way to Tanzania, right, for the same mission. What is the message that you want to bring here? Because this is how I want to look at it. I mean, as an Ethiopian American, and as an African, that's, that, that's, there is that part of you here. And there is that American part of you, and you're representing the U.S. US government. Do both go along very, very, very well. Really well? Very, right? very well. Very, very well. And, and just to clarify, I've been very, very fortunate to be given three sets of responsibilities in the last two, three years with the U.S. government. Initially, the director of the administrator of USAID, Dr. Rajiv Shah, I had worked with him before when he was at the Gates Foundation, and he asked me to serve as a special advisor for him, with him, uh, for about a year. And then I was selected to be a science envoy in 2010. And this last year, 2011, President Obama designated me to serve on the advisory board for uh, the U.S. government, a board called BIFAD, the Board for International Food and Agriculture Development. So I've got I've had these three responsibilities, two of them now, the BIFAD board and the U.S. science envoy. Uh, the mission that brought me on this trip to Ethiopia is the Science Envoy Program. And the message for the, the, the gist of the, the uh, Science Envoy is to really go travel to individual countries and look around to see the opportunities for scientific diplomacy and relationship between the United States and the particular nation I'm visiting. And if there are a range of programs that are now going well to identify those, there are are others, how can we deepen those relationships? And there are, if there are opportunities for bringing about new opportunities, uh, we are also supposed to be looking at that. And so, in, in terms of is there, is there um, a plurality between the two, uh, there really are none. I, I think um, I'm, I'm particularly speaking for the government that had given, designated me as an envoy. I think the one consistent message that you see in the U.S. government under President Obama 
Obama is uh, one of the things that Africans would love to hear, and that is he said, we need to look at aid as a way in which to transition ourselves out of the job. Aid is a way to have the local and the national people help themselves. And so all of the initiatives that he would like to see and encourage is a country-led initiative and giving more and more of the responsibility to the nationals and then finding a way to engage how to strengthen uh, uh, and empower and build capacity, strengthen institutions of the national programs. And this is exactly what the rest of Africans would, would want to hear. But, but it's interesting, uh, as I've said earlier, as you mentioned earlier too, uh, you are uh, advising uh, a government agency which particularly deals with aid. No, uh, it is also a government that deals with technical assistance programs. And one of the things that I spent a lot of my time during this week was really focusing on the things that I think is of significant value in technical assistance. Like what? Capacity building. All of the institutions that are building capacity, and my own personal bias is, even though a poor country like Ethiopia has a lot of needs and a lot of priorities, my own way of looking at it is, of the expansion that is going on at tertiary education, we need to spend a lot, put a lot of attention in, in, we need to celebrate the expansion that is there and because more and more of our young men and women did not have an opportunity to go to college. Now they do. But at the same time, we are creating a situation where the quality is being compromised because we don't have sufficient number of faculty with sufficient experience to be able to train well with the right set of skills and tools so that these graduates have these tools to, uh, with which they would solve the critical problems of a country. And if that doesn't happen very quickly, I worry about what the ramifications are going to be moving forward. And so, and, and the sooner uh, the solution is obtained is better. And so one of the things that I advocate is um, the, the more seasoned professionals in many of our universities in this country today, by themselves or with the help of others in the developed world, can sit down and put together some creative mechanisms upon which one can accelerate the graduate educational program so that college students are not being educated by someone who just graduated from college. Mm -hmm. And so the quality issue is, is very, very critical. And so the U.S. again, the U.S. government and President Obama himself and the U.S. administrator Rajiv Shah, to whom I report, and he has been an advocate of finding creative mechanisms of bringing about technical assistance program to strengthen African institutions, not only colleges, but, but also research and, and seed systems and extension services and so on. And so I think finding this um, great opportunity for having the national programs do the things that they could do best more, and then the areas in which they can't help themselves with, which is tertiary education with limited faculties, be open and engage with others to, to strengthen that. That's all about partnership. You That's about. all a, a partnership, and I'm describing to you now partnership within education, partnership limited to public institutions. But the other thing that I also try to advocate is that you know our government, the government of Ethiopia, here is committed in trying to, to do development work on its own. And I say government can't do it all. You know, the government, it's wonderful to have a government that is committed to development, but, but I think the government that believes it can do it all, uh, I think I, you know, I have difficulty believing whether that is reality or not. And so one of the things that could be done, and the government is beginning to do it, is opening up for more opportunities for the private sector, both from within and outside,
so that this private sector would develop enough that they would begin to hire the young men and women that these institutions are generating in large numbers. With so much responsibility, would you have time for research? You I do. Research. I do. And, and then I'm, I'm, I'm stepping down. I'm rolling back. I'm rolling off of these external responsibilities. But but I'm a person that that has interest not only in education and science and research, but I also have interest in policy issues. And over the years, I like to think that uh, I have accumulated knowledge and experience that could be of use to a poor country like Ethiopia. And so if I have opportunities to provide service in that area, I'll be glad to. Uh, I have been doing that, and I'll continue to do that. But my love is really in teaching and in research, and, and I had just received a major grant from the Gates Foundation to pursue more of the work that I had done in the past to strengthen it even further in more dimension than, than before. And so I'm getting back into the lab to do more of my research. That's where you belong. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Gabi It was a pleasure having you on the Thank show. you very much. Thanks for having me.